prayer letter today, I mentioned that every fundamental doctrine of our faith has its origin in the book of origins, the book of beginnings, the book of Genesis. You can go through the Bible and the book of Genesis and find every major doctrine of what we call the New Testament, which are fundamental to our faith. Second thing I want to point out is Jesus told the disciples on the road to Emmaus that the scriptures are all about him. That means from Genesis all the way to the Revelation. It's all about him. So how is it all about Jesus in the Old Testament? There's a phrase I'm going to use tonight, and some of you are very familiar with the phrase. Maybe you're not, but it's called typology. Biblical typology. What is typology? It's a simple definition, and a simple one I found. It says a type in scripture is a person or a thing in the Old Testament that foreshadows a person or a thing in the New Testament. That's what typology is. So when you're going through a narrative like we are in Genesis 24, you can find it foreshadows a person or event that will take place in the New Testament. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to read the first uh, first 14 verses of Genesis 24. And see, as I read through this, I'll make some comment, but not much. But read as I read through it, see if you can see something or someone that's a foreshadowing of what happens in the New Testament. And it really brings your Bible study alive. As you read through this, it's, it actually helps you get through the genealogies. We haven't gotten there yet, but we are. Co- it's coming. The genealogies, and I remember my aunt uh, Phyllis, she lives in Swannanoa. In fact, my parents were up there to see her. Uh, now she's, you know, she's struggling right now, and we want to keep her in prayer. Phyllis Wright is her name. I remember telling her one time, I went to go spend the weekend with them when I was in college, and so I was over there, and I said, you know, Aunt Phyllis, I just really, the, the genealogies are so boring, you know, and I can't pronounce any of the names. They're no longer boring to me, but I still can't pronounce their names. So I told her, and she says, you know what, Kevin? If the Lord did not have a purpose for them being in the Bible, then they would not have been there. And you know that stuck with me? That everything, every word, every name, every event is there on purpose by the Lord. It is up to me, as a follower of Jesus Christ, to find out that purpose, to find out that meaning. And typology is just one tool or one vehicle, I believe, that the Lord gives us to do that. So let me read the first 14 verses of 24, and then we'll look at a couple of things. Now, Abraham was old, well advanced in age, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. So Abraham said to the oldest servant of his house, who ruled over all that he had, Please put your hand under my thigh, and I will make you swear, verse 3, by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that you will not take a wife for my son from the daughter of the Canaanites among whom I dwell. But you shall go to my country and to my family and take a wife for my son Isaac. And the servant said to him, Perhaps the woman will not be willing to follow me to this land. Must I take your son back to the land from which you came? Verse 6, but Abraham said to him, Beware that you do not take my son back there. The Lord God of heaven, who took me from my father's house and from the land of my family, who spoke to me and swore to me, saying, To your descendants I give this land. He will send his angel before you, and you shall take a wife for my son from there. And if a woman is not willing to follow you, then you will be released from this oath. Only do not take my son back there. Now, he's not named, but we believe this to be Eleazar from Damascus, which was the senior servant of Abraham. In fact, it was Eleazar that Abraham tried to talk the Lord into allowing him to give his inheritance to him because he had no son at that time. Verse 9, so the servant put his hand under the thigh of Abraham, his master, and swore to him concerning this matter. I've been asked, why is that? Well, first of all, it's cultural. But second, putting his hand under the thigh, literally he put his hand on his groins, what it comes down to, because that was the source of life. 
And so he's uh, swearing by all that gives life that I am going to do this. It's an awesome oath. It's an honorable oath. And it's something that uh, he's swearing by everything of, of his life that he's willing to give himself to. Verse 10, then the servant took ten of his master's camels and departed for all of his master's goods were in his hand. And he rose and went to Mesopotamia to the city of Nahor. That's where Abraham came out of, Mesopotamia, modern-day Iraq. And he made his camels kneel down outside the city by a well of water at evening time, the time when women go out to draw water. What I find humorous about verse 11, humorous in this, that the women drew the water. That was woman's work. But most of the cisterns were 50 feet deep. And there was a narrow stairway that went all the way down into uh, the bottom of the cistern to get the water. And then the buckets would hold gallons and gallons and gallons that had to be brought all the way back up for the camels to drink. And, of course, the camels drink a lot of water. She goes all the way back down, bring them all the way back up with the camels or goats or sheep or cattle. And so this is woman's work, but those had to be some strong, strong women. And so it says here in verse 12, And he said, O Lord, God of my master Abraham, please give me success this day and show kindness to my master Abraham. So here we have, again, I believe it's Eleazar praying to God, God the Father, the Lord God, to give him success. And it's also a great reminder that any endeavor that we endeavor to complete, we should always begin with beseeching God for his mercy, for his uh, leading, for his strength, for his counsel. And so I think it's a great, great opportunity to be reminded of that. No matter what we do in this life, there's no big things and little things with God. Everything we are to give to God. And so I think I mentioned this last Wednesday or last Sunday, but there's a difference between a good idea and a God idea. And I I bear the uh, brunt and the consequences and the bruises and the bleeding of good ideas. Uh, It's when we, we need all God ideas. We need Him to lead us. And never get caught in a trap. Guys are worse than women, but we all can do it. It's like, no, I got this. I I don't need to involve God in this. I can make this decision. Beware, because pain is about to follow for having that type of mentality. So he beseeches the Lord. And he says, verse 13, Behold, here I stand at the well of water, and the daughters of the men of the city are coming out to draw water. Now let it be that the young woman to whom I say, Please let down your pitcher that I may drink. And she says, Drink, I will also give your camels a drink. Let her be the one you've appointed for your servant Isaac. And by this I will know that you have shown kindness to my master. So biblical typology, a person or a thing that connects the Old Testament with the New Testament. All of chapter 24, all six, I think it's 67 verses, all 67 verses are a typology. Now, the notes I'm about to give you, I, I just retrieved out of Schofield Study Bible, because I thought it was just great the way he laid it out. But most evangelical commentators agree with the same thing about the typology. And let's see if you caught some of these. And the first one is that Abraham is a type of a certain king who would make a marriage for his son. And we know about the parable of the wedding feast in Matthew chapter 22, where God the Father prepared a wedding feast for his son who was about to be married. And the typology is simply this, that God sent his son, and that we are betrothed to his son, and then once we reach heaven, we are going to participate in the wedding supper of the Lamb. It tells us the second one is that the unnamed servant is the type of the Holy Spirit. It is on purpose that Eleazar is not named. Why is that? Because the Holy Spirit never speaks of himself, but takes of the things of the bridegroom with which to win the bride. Eleazar represented his master. He always pointed people to what Abraham said to what the will of Abraham is, what the desires of Abraham would be. And so it is with the Holy Spirit. I was asked a question, we were, Paul and I were talking about this, you know, how do we praise the Holy Spirit? How do we worship the Holy Spirit as God? We worship and praise the Holy Spirit by worshiping and praising Jesus. That is the ministry of the Holy Spirit. He, is not draw, he will not draw attention to himself. He will always divert attention from himself upon the Son of God. And if you want to honor the Spirit, if you want to worship the Holy Spirit, honor and worship the Son. And so we we believe the unnamed servant is very much a type 
of the Holy Spirit. Again, the third thing is that the, the servant uh, is like the Holy Spirit enriching the bride with the bridegroom's gifts. We're told that when Jesus ascended to heaven, he gave gifts to men. We know them as spiritual gifts. Paul, the apostle, lays out those, some of those gifts in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And we know that Elliot, the unnamed servant, when he met uh, uh, Rebecca's brother Laban, he uh, first of all put a gold ring in her nose. Imagine that. That was desirable. And so he began to laud her with all these uh, diamonds and all this wealth, this gold and this silver. And, of course, the brother-in-law-to-be looked at that, and his eyes got really big. He's like, oh, yes, you want to marry this man because of all that I can get from you. But the Holy Spirit has enriched us with the gifts of the king. Jesus is the baptizer in the Holy Spirit. Jesus is the giver of the gifts to the church. The fourth thing is the Holy Spirit also is the type of the Spirit is bringing the bride to the meeting with the bridegroom. Abraham sent out his servant to retrieve a Gentile bride and bring him back to his son. That is the mission and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Is He has been sent out by Jesus to retrieve us, the Gentiles, to come to faith in our, our bridegroom. And the way he does that is just amazing to me. Rebecca is a type of the church, the ecclesia, the called out, the virgin bride of Christ. We're told that she had never known a man sexually. We're told that her mother and her brother, so her father's not in the scene. Nobody knows why. He's probably either passed from the scene or he's so infirm that he really has no more the ability to you know, call the shots for the family. So Laban, uh, his son, and her brother does it. When uh, Eleazar said, this is what my... Master wants, this is what my ambassador is willing to give you. Uh, may I go ahead and retrieve her and take her back uh, to my master? And Laban said, let us ask the maid. Let us ask Rebecca. And so Rebecca had a decision to make. Does she remain with her family or does she leave, separate herself from her family and follow the servant to go back and be wed to Isaac? And the church is the same way. When we are presented with the gift of salvation, we have a choice. Do we accept the gift or do we reject the gift? Staying in the state of which we are in before Christ is rejecting the gift. Because it's not only saying yes to Jesus, it is also leaving our old life behind. It is separating ourselves from our old life and following Jesus on this great journey of faith. Isaac is the type of the bridegroom, whom not having seen the bride loves for the testimony of the unnamed servant. So he's the type of the bridegroom, loves those because of the witness of the Holy Spirit. And finally, Isaac is the type of the bridegroom who goes out to meet and receive his bride. Now, something very interesting about this. At the end of chapter 22, and this is what I'm going to end with this. At the end of chapter 22, after Isaac survives the sacrifice, he survived, you know, he's, he's 40 years of age, by the way, many people believe. He is not named again. So at the end of chapter 22, when Abraham's coming back down the mountain, Isaac's with him, but he's not named. And he's not named in chapter 23. He's not named in chapter 24. All the way at the end of chapter 24, we find that he is out in the field meditating. Actually, he's praying to the Lord God. And he is uh, reflecting on all the promises of God. And he looks up, and there is Rebecca. What we have is that Jesus left. And as the parable says, he went away to a far country. And we will see him again when he comes for us, the church. So these are just some of the things that Schofield brought these out. I thought he did a great job. And so these are some of the things of typology. It's connecting Old Testament people and events with or foreshadowing uh, the New Testament people and events to help us understand that there's a, even though it's 66 books, written over a several a thousand year period and all the different authors, and there's only one Gentile author, and that is uh, Luke in the New Testament, but they're all written and they have a cohesive theme. There's a, there's a thread that weaves all the way from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22, and it is the thread of redemption. It is all about Jesus 
and how God the Father sent him before the foundation of the earth to choose a bride for himself. And the links that he would go to to retrieve us and make us his own. I love that. A lot of fun, I think. It will build up your faith and confidence in the Lord. Uh, You can stretch it, and there's some people who do, but I believe the Holy Spirit is the teacher, and he will guide us through this. And so I hope this enriches your Bible study. I hope this really uh, illuminates some things. And as you go through the rest of Genesis and on into the Old Testament, look for those types, look for those shadows of what connected to people and events in the New Testament. Amen? I've entitled the passage... Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They are three of the four patriarchs of the book of Genesis. Remember, Genesis, beginning in Genesis 12, when God made a promise to Abraham, and all the way through Genesis chapter 50, it's biographical. It's about the journey of faith for Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. Now, in the verses before us, there's a transition taking place. Abraham will pass off the scene, and the focal point of the promise that God made him will be seen in the person of Isaac, and then it will begin to transfer unto Jacob. Now, in Genesis chapter 24, where we left off last week, Abraham is wanting his servant, we believe it was Eleazar from Damascus, to go and retrieve for his son Isaac a bride. And he wanted the bride to come and live in the land of promise and not in Mesopotamia. Abraham did not want his son returning back to his pagan origins. He was called of God to leave that and go to the land of promise. And so we we ended with Eleazar leaving Abraham and going over and making the journey. It's over 500 miles. Making the journey, it's a long journey. I mean, there was no Uber, <laughs> there was no taxi, there were no trains or planes. Uh, it was just him on foot going, traveling about 500 miles to find a bride for Isaac. And it says here in verse 14 that in Eleazar's praying to the Lord, it says, Now let it be that the young woman to whom I say, Please let down your pitcher that I may drink. And she says, Drink, and I also give your camels a drink. Let her be the one you've appointed for your servant Isaac, and by this I will know that you have shown kindness to my master. Now what's interesting to me is that Eleazar had a dilemma. He had to find a woman that was fit to be Isaac's bride, a woman he had never met before but was from the family of Abraham. So he is going to a place he has never been to find a woman he has never met to retrieve her and bring her back to his Master, So he did what every believer should do when presented with a challenge in our life. Uh, over, sometimes an overwhelming circumstance and take it to the Lord. And he was very specific with the Lord. He said, Lord, here's how I know uh, who the woman will be. When I come to a well, the one that is willing to retrieve water for my camel and for me, I will take that as a sign that this is from you. Is there anything wrong with it? Asking the Lord for a sign. I don't think so. I think it is good to say, Lord, I want to know that it's you. I want to know it's you and not just what I ate last night or, or it's my own thinking, my own imagination. I want to know it's from you. Now, what's interesting is most of the cisterns were very, very deep in the ground, and there would be a very narrow stairway that would, or sometimes a ladder that would descend into the cistern, and that a woman would have to, she did this, go down there and get, sometimes I read were up to 50 gallons of water to bring it back up for the camel to drink. Could you imagine the back-breaking labor that was? And so this, this is the prayer that Eliezer Church. I want a woman who doesn't mind breaking her back so that I can have a drink of water. And so it says here in verse 15, And it happened before he had finished speaking that, behold, Rebekah, who was born to Bethel, son of Milcah, the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother, came out with her pitcher on her shoulder. Man, I, I wish my prayer life was like that. It says, before he had finished praying, the answer of his prayer came his way. Uh, Don't you wish your prayers were like that? We were kidding with uh, Mike uh, Baker at the pastoral care meeting because he had prayed with his son who had a very serious prayer request in his life. And he called his dad sometime later and said that the Lord answered his father's prayer and he had received this incredible thing in his life. 
And, and so we all decided that when everybody has a need, we'll just send them to Mike Baker because it seems like that he's not only getting prayers answered, they're quick prayers. So, you know, what, happen, what happens when God doesn't answer our prayer right away? What happens when we pray for something and nothing happens? I mean, in this case, it's before he even finished praying. Well, I like what John said in 1 John chapter 5, verse 14. He said this, now this is the confidence, this is the assurance, this is something that we can take to the bank that we have in him, that is in God. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Isn't that an awesome promise? Eleazar was told to go and retrieve a bride for his master's son. So he was praying to God to be able to accomplish this. So he was praying God's will. And he had the assurance, and we have the assurance, that when we pray according to the will of God, that he hears us. Now, my understanding of that phrase, hears us, is kind of the ability, the word picture I've been given is the ability that God gives the deer in the forest that he is able to tune out all the other noise around him when there is a predator approaching. That's why there's so many uh, frustrated uh, hunters in this world. It's because God has given that deer the ability to hear the predator approaching. That's the word picture we're given that God is able, he can't be distracted, he's God. And so even a seven point Two billion people all cried out to him at the same time. He is able in his infinite uh, presence to heal each and every one of them in detail, to hear them. So he hears us and says, we know that he hears us. Whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. That is given to us the confidence that even though the prayer is not answered as quick as Eleazar's prayer, we have the confidence that God has heard us and that God will Answer our prayer. This says here in verse 16, Now the young woman was very beautiful to behold. A virgin, no man had known her, and she went down to the well, filled her pitcher, and came up. So what's interesting is that, you know, there's an old saying, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. My grandfather used to have this saying, I've always loved it. He said, beauty is skin deep, ugly is to the bone. Beauty soon fades away, but ugly holds its own. I've never forgotten that. I always thought that was great. But here, the beauty of uh, Rebecca was in the eyes of Eleazar. He saw her as beautiful. And again, as I mentioned earlier uh, in the evening, that Rebecca is a type. There's a type. She represents something in the New Testament. She represents the church. And what we have here is that Jesus sees us is very beautiful. We may not feel beautiful. We may not act beautiful. But when Jesus sees us, he sees us in our perfected state. And I think that's something we need to hear from time to time, that God sees us in our perfected state, much like uh, Isaac would see Rebekah, much like Abraham's servant Eleazar saw Rebekah. That's how God sees us. Peter said it this way in 1 Peter 4 and 8, And above all things, have a fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. Now, what is that saying to us as people, that when we have a love for one another, there are things that we will gloss over. There's things that we will ignore. It's not talking about blatant sin. It's talking about the little slights that we give one another, the little time, the times we get offended at one another, that when we have a love for one another, we are willing to cover that up because we're saying, you know what, I love you, and I'm going to let this go. And that's not something that's done naturally. That's something that can only come from the aid of the Holy Spirit in our life that love, because in the big scope of things, uh, being offended or being hurt or even being frustrated or angry, uh, it's it's not going to do anything for us. So here's, she's a very beautiful to behold, a virgin, no man had known her. And this is what she did. She went down to the well, filled her pitcher and came up, verse 17, and the servant ran to meet her and said, please let me drink a little water from your pitcher. So here she is. She's made this back-breaking journey down the ladder, down the steps, she brings up these heavy, heavy things of water to feed, to give to her camels. And now this guy she's never met before in her life says, will you do the same for me? And then we see a little bit of the character of Rebecca. So that's what she did. It says in verse 8, so she said, drink my Lord. Then she quickly let her pitcher down to her hand and gave him a drink, knowing that she was going to have to go back down into the cistern to retrieve more water for her uh, 
for her animals. You know what's interesting to me is that we see that Rebecca had a heart of a servant. Here's one of the things that Peter tells us about a woman's beauty. When a woman has a love for God, when a woman has a heart for God, it's that inward beauty that makes her physically attractive. It's not, it's not the jewelry and it's not the makeup, it's not the clothing, it's not the way a woman holds herself naturally. And those things can make a woman attractive, but true beauty is a woman who has a heart for the Lord. She is a gracious woman. She has a heart of a servant. And that's what made her so attractive, so appealing uh, to Eleazar. And I think that it can be said of men and women, what makes us attractive and appealing is when we have a heart of a servant. And I have found that when you're walking with the Lord, the, the natural thing that comes out of you is that you're very gracious, a very giving, a very, a very much want to serve, very, very humble. I, I think it is an oxymoron for a Christian to be arrogant a Christian to be stingy. That tells me there's still an unfinished work of the Holy Spirit in your life if you tend to be that type of person or that you're turning more to what you used to be like before Christ instead of living uh, the, the strength and the beauty of the new life. I never want to be considered arrogant. I, I never want to be stingy. I don't, I don't want to be ungracious. I don't want to be condescending. It's the work of the Holy Spirit in our life that makes us gracious and gives us the heart of a servant. This is here in verse 26, that after he finds out, he goes back with her, meets her brother, meets her brother Laban. And it says in verse 26 that the man bowed down his head and worshipped the Lord. He realized that after meeting uh, Rebecca, because she did exactly what he asked the Lord for her to do, he recognized that God had heard her prayer. And I thought about the joy of knowing when God answers a prayer. And I think it's kind of sad sometimes that the Lord does all these things and then we take the credit for it or we forget that we asked him to do it. You know, there's two ways that God works in our life. He works through providence, that is the natural course of events, to bring about his purpose. And he also works in the miraculous, where it's obvious that there's been divine intervention in our life. And so this is miraculous. But it's also God's providence, God working through the natural course of events to bring about this uh, marital union between Rebecca and Isaac. And I think that uh, Eleazar's response in verse 26 was the proper response, recognizing that what he had been given had been given to him by God, that God had heard his prayer and that God had also answered his prayer. I also think about Matthew's gospel, about the ten lepers that came to Jesus begging him to cleanse them. And the Lord said he did, and the Bible says that the Lord did. He cleansed all ten of them. And they went away, but one of the ten did something the other nine didn't. They went on their way, never to come across Jesus again. But one of them returned back to Jesus and simply gave thanks to him for healing him. And I think that's what's happening here in verse 26. I think uh, Eleazar is giving thanks to God, and I think it's also good for us to give thanks to to God. What about, have you ever heard that it's good to give thanks in, um, in faith? What do I mean by that? You ask God for something and you go ahead and thank him in advance for answering it? I think absolutely. I think that it will build your faith. I think it honors the Lord. And it's also a uh, confession of faith that, Lord, I trust you that you have heard my prayer and you're going to answer my prayer uh, According to your will and what's best for my life, it may not come across the way I want it, but I know you're going to only give me what is best for my life that will bring you glory, so I thank you in advance. In verse 27 it says, And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of my master Abraham, who has not forsaken his mercy and his truth toward my master. As for me, being on the way, the Lord led me to the house of my master's brethren. Isn't it amazing? 500-mile journey and the servant of Abraham realized as he looked back over the journey and where he had arrived at his destination that God had led him the entire way. And I think that's something for us to remember. You may not feel God. You may not see God. You may not hear God. But God is with you and he is leading you in this life. Yes. Psalm 37 verse 23, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delights in his way. I like that. The Lord delights in my way. Not only does he delight in me, he delights in my way. 
Wow, that's a, what a beautiful truth that is. Proverbs 4 and 12. When you walk, your steps will not be hindered, and when you run, you will not stumble. Proverbs 16, verse 9. A man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. That's the confidence we have. That's the assurance we have that God is leading us. We jump down to verse 59 after meeting with, uh, again, Rebecca's family, Laban, her brother, and Rebecca's mother. The father is not in the picture. He's either passed or he is in such a state of infirmity that he can no longer lead the family. So Laban has taken over uh, the leadership of the family. So Eleazar is speaking with Laban in the place of the father and, of course, Rebecca's mother. And they said, listen, if she wants to go with you, we're going to let her decide. And so Eleazar said, will you come? and be wed to my master's son? And Rebecca simply said, yes, I will. Now, here's the thing about the promises of God. And here's the thing about when God calls us to do something. He calls us, he makes a promise, but yet we have to respond to that. If Rebecca does not respond, if Rebecca Rebecca doesn't say anything, then the promise of God in her life would not have been fulfilled. There has to be a response. There has to be obedience in faith. And Rebecca did obey in faith, and she took that step. Could you imagine? She'll never see her family again in this life. She's going to meet a man she has never met in her life, on the promise that they are relatives, on the promise that he will provide for her, protect her, and love her all the days of her life. Is that not the promise that God makes to us? Trust in me for the forgiveness of sins. I will protect you, and I will provide for you, and I will lead you, and I will love you from everlasting to everlasting. There has to be a response. And I thank Rebecca, because she does get into some shenanigans. I mean, she has some ways about her, but we have to give honor where honors due. She said yes to what God had promised. So it says in verse 59, So they sent away Rebecca, their sister, and her nurse, and Abraham's servant, and his men. Verse 60, And they blessed Rebecca and said to her, Our sister, may you become the mother of thousands of ten thousands, and may your descendants possess the gates of those who hate them. Then Rebecca and her maids arose, and they rode on the camels and followed the man. So the servant looked, took Rebecca and departed. Verse 67, and we're told that it says, Then Isaac, when he saw Rebecca come, he had been out in the field meditating, and what is believed is he was actually praying to the Lord. He's also in grief over his mother Sarah, who had passed three years previously. And it says in verse 6, And Isaac, when he saw Rebekah, brought her into his mother Sarah's tent, and he took Rebekah, and she became his wife, and he loved her. I've heard some Bible commentators say the greatest love story ever written is this chapter right here of Isaac and Rebekah. So Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. And so here he is married to Rebekah, and she comforted him concerning her mother's death. Again, as Christians, we're called to comfort one another in our grief. We are to comfort in our grief. And how do we do that? We tell and comfort them by sometimes just being there for them and encouraging them with the truth concerning God. When it comes to a death of a loved one, we encourage them that Sarah, who was a believer in God by faith, that she is in heaven. And that one day that Isaac would see her again. And she was not in pain. She was not frail. She was there in the perpetual state of the joy of her Lord. And we are to do that for one another. Sometimes Christians, in an attempt to help someone feel better, we try to stifle the grief. We try to tell them, you know, it's time to move on. And I, I just think that's a mistake. I think it's a mistake because I believe that grief is something that can be used by God um, to help us. I really believe that. We're never, we're never told in the Bible we are to stop grieving over the loss of a loved one. We are to grieve in hope. So our job as Christians is to help a person in their grief to grieve in hope, the hope of what God has in store for them. 
So we come to chapter 25 now, and we see it's the death of Abraham. It's the, the chapter starts off very interesting. It says, Abraham, who's now more than 140 years old, marries another woman and has 12 sons by her. Apparently, when God healed him of the inability at 100 to have children, it was that, that, that life was still there. And so he goes on and has more and more children. And so when God does something, he does it right. And so it says here in verse 7, though, that this is the sum of the years of Abraham's life, which he lived. So this is the totality of his life, 175 years. And it says here in verse 8, Then Abraham breathed his last and died in a good old age. It means he was in good condition still. He was still able to have children. He was still able to function as a man. He was still able to live a life that was enjoyable for the most part. I remember one of the guys that, that when King David who was returning back to Jerusalem uh, after running from Absalom, his son, he was coming back to Jerusalem. One of the men that helped him earlier in his reign as king uh, was there uh, also helping David as he was running from Absalom. And David said to him, and the name escapes me, David said to Absalom, he says, hey, I mean, it says to this man, says, why don't you come back and you will always have a place at my table. I'll provide for you in your elderly age. I'll provide for you. You'll have a bed to sleep in. You'll have a roof over your head and I will feed you every day. And he said, look, I'm too old for that. I can't taste food anymore and I have no desire for women anymore. And so he was just telling him, basically, I'm ancient. I'd rather remain here in the home of my fathers and then I will go on and meet God after this, but Abraham was someone who still had the desire uh, for women and also had the desire and the ability to taste good food and to live a life uh, of strength. He was 170 years, five years old, and he died in a good old age, an old man and full of years. And then something was interesting and was gathered to his people. Who's his people? Well, we know Sarah went on before him, but that's it. It's a a spiritual connotation. Abraham had a belief in life after death. Amazing, isn't it? All the way back in the book of Genesis. He understood that there was life after death. And it says here in verse 9, His sons Isaac and Ishmael buried him in the cave of Machpelah, which is before Mamre in the field of Ephron, the son of Zoar, the Hittite. So he was gathered unto his people. What, What does that mean? I want to read what Paul wrote in Ephesians, and I'll tell you what I believe Abraham was saying. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 8, it says, Therefore he says, when he, being Jesus, ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this, he ascended. What does it mean? But that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth. He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. You see, before the cross of Jesus Christ, when an Old Testament saint, a man or a woman in the Old Testament dispensation, placed their faith in God, they did not go directly to heaven. They went to what the Bible calls Abraham's bosom or the place of comfort. Another Old Testament word, it can be used for grave, but it's also used for the place that Abraham went called Sheol. What it means is that when Abraham died, he went to the place of comfort. It became as known as Abraham's bosom because he was the originator or the father of all those who died in their faith in the Old Testament before the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. We're told in Luke chapter 16 about the rich man and Lazarus. Both men died. The rich man lifted his eyes up in torment and eternal flame. Lazarus was comforted in Abraham's bosom. It's not a parable. It was some, there was a literal rich man. There was a king of some kind. We don't know his name. And also Lazarus, a poor beggar, who went, when he died, he had placed his faith in God, so he went to Abraham's bosom, and the king, went, the rich man, went to the place of torment. And the rich man looked over this gulf to Abraham's bosom and saw that Lazarus was being comforted. And he actually begged the Lord to allow uh, Lazarus to dip his finger in water and come and quench his thirst. And the Lord responded to him, there's a great gulf between thee and he, and there's no, there's no way, there's no crossing over. So is, is Sheol in the inner part of the earth? I think so. 
And so what I think happened, what I believe happened, is that Abraham descended into Abraham's bosom as a holding place. And all the old, t- Moses, Elisha, Elijah, Daniel, Zechariah, Haggai, all of them went to Sarah, Rachel, Rebecca, all those who died in faith in the Old Testament went to Abraham's bosom or the place of comfort. But the day that Jesus Christ was crucified, the, what Paul is saying is that when he died and breathed his last breath before he ascended to the heavens, he first descended into Abraham's bosom to do what? To set the captive free. He set them free. And do you know that's why Matthew 27 says some of the Old Testament saints were seen walking the streets of Jerusalem? He set them free. Peter also tells us he also preached judgment to the unbeliever that was in the place of torment. But he set the captive free and they ascended to the heaven, the third heaven. And now for the believer, we don't go to Abraham's bosom. We go directly into the presence of God. But it's amazing to me that Abraham recognized that even though he closed his eyes in this life, he would open his eyes up in everlasting life. He was a man. Of, and the reason he can do this is because he's a man of faith. You place your faith in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you are guaranteed to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. You are guaranteed everlasting life, that even though you die, yet shall you live. You shall never die. The body may die, but the spirit lives on forever and ever. In verse 20 of chapter 25, we come to a a very important monumental prophecy given to Isaac concerning his twin sons that would be born, Jacob and Esau. It says here in verse 20 that Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah as his wife, the daughter of Bethuel, the Syrian of Padam Aram, the sister of Laban, the Syrian. Now Isaac pleaded with the Lord for his wife because she was barren. So, you know, a woman being barren in that culture, it's just like today there is an emptiness, there is a void. And especially for a Jewish woman, we know a Jewish woman to want to have a child, it was something that was very much desired. And Isaac, being a good husband, pleaded with the Lord. I, th- I think, again, what a beautiful type for us that when our spouse is going through something, one of the ways that we can help is by going to the Lord in prayer. Because she was barren and the Lord granted his plea and Rebecca. His wife conceived. Now, something interesting here. They got married at 40 years of age. And so, unlike Eleazar, before he finished praying, the Lord answered his prayer. Isaac was 60 years of age when she was, uh, when Rebecca finally gave birth. So, 20 year time period. It's just like the 25 year time period between when God told Abraham and Sarah that they should have a son. And that their descendants would be the stars of the sky, the sand on the seashore. That took many, many years. So there is a length of time where they had to wonder, did God hear my prayer? Is God going to answer my prayer? But as we find out over and over again, God always fulfills his word. It says here in verse 22, But the children struggled together within her, and she said, If all is well, why am I like this? So she went to inquire of the Lord. Again, I think the pattern is being set here. Her husband Isaac is uh, seeking the Lord. She knows something's not right with this pregnancy. Something is, just doesn't feel right. Something is wrong. What does she do? She inquires of the Lord. Whenever we are presented with a challenge that we cannot figure out, never be shy about inquiring of the Lord. Remember what your teachers used to say to you, and we have teachers in our uh, ministry today, is that the only... Dumb question is the question not asked. You know, the Lord is not saying, no, I don't want to hear that from you today. Or, you know, you know, Rebecca, I've heard from you before. I want you to leave me alone. Come back when I have some more time. No, no, no. He desires to us to inquire of him. In fact, James, the brother of Jesus, says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all men generously without finding fault. God wants us to come to him. God wants us to inquire of him. And so she did that. She inquires of the Lord. And the Lord answered her. Verse 23. And the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb. 
two people shall be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. It's interesting to note how many times that the firstborn is not the one that God chooses. Because in that culture is that the firstborn received a double portion of his father's inheritance. All the other children uh, would receive an inheritance, but the firstborn received a double portion. Now, it's interesting about Isaac. We're told in Genesis chapter 25, uh, earlier in the chapter, that God, I mean, Abraham gave gifts to all of his children from Keturah and all the, his, uh, the sons of Ishmael. Remember, Ishmael was his firstborn son, but he gave all that he had to his son Isaac. So here, Isaac's not the firstborn. And then we come to find out that Esau, even though he's the firstborn, that Jacob was chosen by God. And so it says here in verse 24, So when her days were fulfilled for her to give birth, indeed there were twins in her womb. Her womb. And so it begs the question, why does God choose one over the other? Why did God choose Isaac over Ishmael? Well, that's a little easy for us to figure out because Ishmael came about as uh, a way of Abraham and Sarah trying to help God out. And Isaac was the son of promise. That's a little easier to figure out. But what about Jacob and Esau? In fact, we read later in the Bible that God says in the book of Romans that God says, uh, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. That seems kind of harsh. Why, why is it? Why did God choose Jacob over Esau? Why did he give the prophecy to Rebekah that the, young, the older shall serve the younger? I believe Paul answers that for us in Romans chapter 9 and verse 9 because it has to do with the sovereignty of God. That God can show mercy to whom he wants to show mercy. God can choose whom he wants to choose. We may not like that choice, we may not fully understand that choice, but God is God. It's to remind us of that God is the creator and we are the creation. Romans 9 and 9 says this, For this is the word of promise. At this time I will come, and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one man, even by our father Isaac, for the children not yet being born, nor have done any good or any evil, that the purpose of God according to election, might stand, not of works, but of him who calls. That's interesting. God said, I didn't choose Jacob because he was good and Esau was evil, even though Esau would be an evil man and Jacob would end up being a man of faith. He said, no, this was done before they ever did these things. It has a lot to do with God's foreknowledge of how things are going to play out, but it's God's sovereign choice. Verse 12, it was said to her, the older shall serve the younger, as is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. Hard for us to understand, but what it comes down to is God is sovereign. And and we may not fully understand that, but it's better for us to rest in that, knowing that God knows exactly what he has doing. Spurgeon was asked one time about this verse, You know, do you struggle with the idea that God loved Jacob and hated Esau? And Spurgeon responded, he said, no, I struggle more with the idea of why does God love me instead of hating me. And so it's hard to understand. But here it said it had nothing to do with their behavior, had nothing to do with their character, had nothing to do with their name. It had to do with God sovereignly choosing Jacob to be the inheritor of the promises of God. Chapter 26 The transition is continuing now. We're moving. We've moved from Abraham now into Isaac. And we find out that Isaac ends up repeating the same mistakes as his father, Abraham. It is a great reminder for us, not only just as men, but as women, that we instill in our children not only a fear of God and a love for God, and the knowledge of his commandments, but also that we are also walking in the fear of the Lord, that we are walking in faith with the Lord, obeying his commandments. You know why? Our children end up imitating us. It says here in verse 1, There was a famine in the land, besides the first famine that was in the days of Abraham, and Isaac went to Abimelech, king of the Philistines, in Gerar. Then the Lord appeared to him and said, Do not go down to Egypt, Live in the land in which I shall tell you. Don't go down to Egypt. 
even though you think, that's what Abraham did before, 100 years earlier, he went down to Egypt, got himself in all kinds of hot water by lying about his wife, and he did it out of fear of not having enough food, even when God told him, don't go down there, and I will provide for you. Even though there is a famine, I will provide for you. And Abraham acted out of fear and got himself in trouble. And so now God is trying to help Isaac not repeat the same mistake. Do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land which I shall tell you. Verse 3, dwell in this land, and I will be with you and bless you. For you, to you and your descendants I give all these lands, and I will perform the oath which I swore to Abraham, your father. So he says, here you are in Gerar of the Philistines. If you will dwell here, I will bless you, and I will provide for you and your descendants, and all these lands will belong to you. That's very interesting. I want you to see the word dwell there. I want you to hang on that word just for a moment. And then in verse 4 it says, And I will make your descendants multiply as the stars of the heaven, I will give to your descendants in all these lands, and in your seed, that's singular, by the way, referring to Messiah, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. So what God does to Isaac, he said, if you will obey my command and dwell in this land, remember, he's in Gerar of the Philistines, the capital city of the Philistines, then I will bless you, I will provide for you, and I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars of the sky. He is reaffirming the covenant that he made with Abraham. And he says this because in verse 5, because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. What I find interesting about that is Abraham didn't always keep the commandments of the Lord or obey him all the time. And yet when God looks, speaks of Abraham, he's dead. He's been gathering to his people. God speaks to him as if he was always faithful. Again, it's the grace of God. It's the mercy of God that God sees us different than we see ourselves. We feel so lousy. We feel like a bum. We feel like I can't do anything right. I'm always messing it up. And yet, it says, I blessed Abraham because Abraham obeyed my voice. And he didn't say, he obeyed my voice except that time he lied about Sarah. You know, he he didn't do that. And he didn't say, okay, he obeyed my laws except when he went and had uh, sexual relationships with uh, Sarah's handmaid, Hagar. No, he didn't say that. He said, Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. So you think that Isaac is listening. I mean, he's engaged. Yes, if I stay here, then God will bless me, because it says here in verse 6, so Isaac dwelt in Gerar. Here's the problem. For the rest of the chapter, almost to the end of the chapter, God remains silent. He ends up, responding in fear, afraid of the Philistines, and lies about Rebekah being his wife and says that she is his sister, much like his father did. He ended up sinning. Abimelech, the king, says, what have you done? If one of us would have touched your wife, then we would have been guilty um, before God. It is believed, even though it had been a hundred years since Abraham had done this, that the king at that time, Abimelech simply means king, that rebuked Abraham, told each of his descendants, if this ever happens again, don't fall for the same trap I did. And apparently they listened because they said, we almost touched her. But what happened is God allowed Abimelech to see uh, Isaac and Rebekah. He saw Isaac caressing Rebekah. Otherwise they were just, they were in each other's arms. And he saw that as a man treats his wife. He's like, oh, I recognize this. What have you done to us? And here's the problem. That's why I wanted you to hang on the word uh, dwelt in verse 3. Verse 6, it means to settle down, to abide, to make a lengthy stay. That's what verse 6 means. He dwelt there. The word dwell in verse 3 The King James actually has it better. It means sojourn. What God had told Isaac to do is that don't go down to Egypt. I want you to temporarily stay here in Gerar. I'm going to give you all this land, but I don't want you to remain here. I want this to be a temporary place. What does he do? He ends up making it his 
place of dwelling, and he's never going to move. This is the best thing that's ever happened. It means that commerce was good. It means he had relations with his neighbors. It means that his kids probably, you know, he liked where he, where he was, and he wasn't going to move. And God was displeased. He tried to circumvent the will of God. He stayed where he was not supposed to stay. Here's the thing for us as Christians. This world is not our home. We are foreigners and aliens sojourning through this. Our home is a heavenly city. Our heart, which means our affection, our mind, and our strength is to be longing for and working toward that city. And so what happens sometimes, we get laden down with the affections and desires of this life. And what happens? Isaac sins. He has relationship with God has been broken. I mean, fellowship with God has been broken. He uh, doesn't hear him. He doesn't feel him. He doesn't see him. And the problem, I believe, it's amazing to me. Abimelech, 100 years earlier, began to share, we think, it's implied to his descendants, watch out for this. 100 years later, his great-great-great-grandson finds out, hey, 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 hey. Your great-great-great-grandpappy tried the same deal on us. On my great-great-grandpappy, I'm not going there. And so even though Isaac had made the decision to dwell in Gerar, King Abimelech said, get out. You are not welcome here. There's no place for you here because of what you have done to us. Let me tell you something. Isaac may have tried to circumvent the will of God, but the Bible says, many are the man's of plan, many are the plans of man, but the Lord's purpose prevails. So here Isaac is rooted and grounding himself in Gerar. God said, I'll fix that. You, you think that you're going to be happy here? I will make you a stench in the nostrils of your neighbors. And that's exactly what happened. But here's something else I think. I wonder, you know, if Abimelech would do this for his sons, why did Abraham not do it for his son? You see, I think it's, it's important for us as parents, as leaders, that we pass down our faith to our children and our grandchildren, and we be very, very vocal about it. Why we do what we do, what we believe about God, why we believe it, and what needs to be said. The enemy, and even our own flesh, will try to silence us. We don't want to offend. We don't want to say something. And yet, if we're silent too long and don't speak up for the important things, then our kids end up doing what Isaac did. I love what Proverbs said. And Solomon said this about his father, David. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 3, When I was my father's son, tender and the only one in the sight of my mother, which had been Bathsheba, he also taught me and said to me, Let your heart retain my words, keep my commands, and live. Get wisdom, get understanding, do not forget nor turn away from the words of my mouth. I think it's a reminder that as parents, we have a responsibility. And that responsibility carries through all the days of our child's life. If they end up growing into adults, and even senior adults, and the Lord grants us long life and we see them, we still have a responsibility to pass on what we know about God to them and to our descendants. I just wonder if Abraham had been more vocal about his faith, would, would, uh, would Isaac done the same thing? I think what happened is Isaac ends up seeing what his father does and ends up doing the same thing. So finally, he goes out, and it says in verse 23, being thrown out <laughs> by the Philistines, it says, he, Then he went up from there to Beersheba. That's where God had told him to dwell. He finally repented and went to the place that God had told him to. Instead of going from point A to point B, uh, he went to try to go to point C before B and live in C when he should have been in B, and he ended up a disaster. And notice what happens in verse 24. When he has repented and gone where God told him to go, and the Lord appeared to him the same night. And said, I am the God of your father Abraham. Do not fear, for I am with you 
I will bless you and multiply your descendants for my servant Abraham's sake. He reaffirms the covenant. He reaffirms that, that he doesn't have to be in fear. And it only took place where he went where God told him to go. When we obey God, God reassures our heart, even though it seems bleak, even though it seems like the odds are against us, that God is with us. Finally, in chapter 27, there's 46 verses here. We'll look at a few of them. I entitled this chapter, Deception That Destroyed a Family. Deception Destroyed a Family. Here you have Isaac, Rebekah, and their two sons, which were named Jacob and Esau. And it says that Jacob and Esau were brothers that were at odds with one another. And something happened that was so terrible that Isaac loved Esau for what he could do for him. He loved Esau because he was a hunter. He loved Esau because he was able to cook a certain way venison that he liked very much. And it's so sad to me because whether he meant to or not, Esau, all Esau knew of his father Isaac was that if he performed well, then he had not only his father's approval but his father's love. And how important it is that our children know that we love them because we love them, because that's how God loves us. God doesn't love us because we're good Christians. God's love makes us good Christians, but God doesn't love us because I'm a preacher. God doesn't love, uh, love me because I do certain things in the church. God doesn't love me because I share my faith. I do those things in response to God's, God's love. But here, all Esau knew is that his father loved him for what he could do for him. And we're also told that Re, uh, Re, uh, Rebecca loved Jacob. Now, was that in response to he knew, she knew that uh, Isaac picked Esau? We're not sure. And sometimes Jacob gets a bad rap because the Bible tells us in New King James that Jacob was, uh, or Esau was an outdoorsman, Jacob was a plain man. That's the English word that is used. But in the Hebrew, it actually means a complete man. And here you go. You're going to love this. It also means a perfect man. And again, that's how God saw Jacob. God saw him as perfect. God saw him as complete, even though his name means heel catcher, and it came to mean deceiver. And so Jacob lived up to the name his mother and father gave him as a heel catcher or as a deceiver. But God saw him as complete, and God saw him as a perfect. So Rebecca loved Jacob and Isaac loved Esau. And then it says here in verse 1 of chapter 27, Now it came to pass when Isaac was old and his eyes were so dim that he could not see, that he called Esau his older son and said to him, My son, and he answered him and said, Here I am. We're going to find out that at this time Isaac is 180 years old. He is blind. He is crippled. He is bedridden. And we can imagine how, how difficult that must have been for him to find out that he was not able to live a vigorous life like his father, that he was um, old and infirmed. And there's something else weighing on his mind. His brother Ishmael, we're told, died at 137 years old. I'm sorry, he's not 180 at this time, he's 137. Isaac's 137 years old, and we know, he knows that his brother Ishmael died at 137 years old. So he thinks this is it. I'm blind, I'm infirmed, I'm no good to anybody, so I'm about to die. What's sad is he lived to be 180, but in his mind, because his brother died at 137, and he was in the condition he was physically, not only did he believe he was going to die, but I believe he also wanted to die. I believe he was in so much pain, and he was so depressed about his inability to do anything that he longed to die. And there are people like that today. They feel like they're no good, they feel like there's nowhere to go, and they just want to die. So he said to Esau in verse 2, and he said, Behold, now I am old. I do not know the day of my death. Now, therefore, please take your weapons, your quiver, and your bow, and go out to the field and hunt game for me. And make me savory food, such as I love. There again, there again. It's a conditional love. And bring it to me that I might eat, that my soul may bless you before I die. What a, I, I'm sorry, it's a sad thing to me. Go and do what I approve of and why I love you before I die, and then I'll bless you. Now, here's the problem. Isaac not only had conditional love, 
but he was trying to circumvent the will of God. God had emphatically stated that Jacob should receive his inheritance, not Esau. That the older one would serve the younger. Isaac, because of his conditional love for Esau, was trying to circumvent the will of God. These guys weren't perfect. We know that. Thank God the Bible writes about it. And tried to give the blessing to Esau when God said it should go to Jacob. Verse 5. Now Rebekah was listening when Isaac spoke to Esau and his son. And Esau went to the field to hunt game and to bring it. And in verse 8 it says, Now therefore, she's speaking to uh, Jacob, my son, obey my voice according to what I command you. Here's what you're going to do. Your, bro- your brother's out there hunting food. He's going to bring it back, and he's going to cook it, and he's going to get the blessing of your father, but I'm not having any of that. So verse 9, go to the flock and bring me from there two choice kids of the goats, and I will make savory food from them for your father such as he loves. Then you shall take it to your father that he may eat it, and that he may bless you before his death. So that's exactly what Jacob does. Jacob's a little bit afraid. He says, what if my, my, my brother's a hairy man? Esau means red, means hairy. What, what am I supposed to do? So what does Rebecca do? She gives him clothes and puts it over his hands and makes him feel hairy. He's blind, her husband. She is conniving against her husband. She's deceiving her husband. And so it says that Jacob went in there and, and um, Isaac... Uh, has no idea what's going on because it says here in verse 18, So Jacob went to his father and said, My father. And he said, Here I am. Who are you, my son? Verse 19, Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done just as you told me. Please arise. Oh, my goodness, what a lie. Please arise, sit, and eat of my game that your soul may bless me. But Isaac said to his son, How is it that you have found it so quickly, my son? How are you able to I just sent you out. How are you able to do this so quick? And listen to how... Now, in his deception, Jacob brings God into the equation. And he said, because the Lord your God brought it to me. Don't think we don't do that today. We try sometimes to to justify our behavior, and dare I say it, justify our sin by saying, the Lord told me to do this. I did this for the Lord's sake. And what an abhorrent thing to say. Jacob not only was lying to his father, he brought God into the equation. And so he ends up, what happens? He ends up receiving the blessing from his father. Now, listen, it was the will of God that Jacob received the blessing. It was not the will of God that Jacob deceived his father to receive the blessing. Verse 30 says, Now it happened as soon as Isaac had finished blessing Jacob, And Jacob had scarcely gone out from the presence of Isaac, his father, that Esau, his brother, came in from his hunting. And his father Isaac said to him, Who are you? So he said, I am your son, your firstborn Esau. Then, verse 33, Isaac trembled exceedingly. It says that he trembled with a great tremble. Now, why would he do that? He he knew that not only had he been deceived, but he knew that he had been busted. He knew that God knew what had happened. That not only had Jacob deceived him, but he had actually tried to contrive uh, Jacob out of the will for Esau to receive the benefit of the will because of his love for Esau. That's why the great tremble. It wasn't just in anger. It was in fear. He knew that he tried to uh, play chess with God and checkmate just happened. He trembled exceedingly and said, Who? Where is the one who hunted game and brought it to me? I ate all of it before you came, and I have blessed him. And indeed, he shall be blessed. When Esau heard the words of his father, he cried with an exceedingly great and bitter cry and said to his father, Bless me also, O my father. But verse 35, But he said, Your brother came with the seat and has taken away your blessing. Who is the guilty party? All four of them. All four of them. It wasn't just Jacob. Isaac tried to circumvent God's plan. Rebekah conceived a plan to deceive her husband. Esau despised his birthright, lived by the lust of the flesh. Jacob lied and deceived his father and brother. We're told in Hebrews that Esau 
cried with tears, but could not find repentance. Why? Had he, had he done the incredible sin that could not be forgiven? No. What he cried about was that he did not receive his father's blessing. He never once repented. If Esau would have repented, God would have received him. But instead, his only sorrow was he didn't get the blessings from his father. He didn't get the riches of his father's inheritance that he believed was due to him. But all four were guilty. Deception destroys a family. Deception destroys our relationship with God. So verse 41 says, So Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing with his father blessed him. And Esau said in his heart, The days of my mourning for my father at hand, then I will kill my brother Jacob. He never repented. He never repented, nor did he desire to repent. What's so sad about this is we know what happens to someone who won't repent. They go into eternity, uh, eternal torment. But not only did Esau not repent, he never desired to repent. He had this hatred festering in him to the point he wanted to kill his brother. Now, his brother and he ended up reconciling down the road. We'll see that in the weeks ahead. But he never repented of his sin. Verse 42, And the words of Esau, her older son, were told to Rebekah. So she sent and called Jacob, her younger son, and said to him, Surely your brother Esau comforts himself concerning you, intending to kill you. Now therefore, my son, obey my voice, arise, flee to my brother Laban in Haran, and stay with him a few days until your brother's fury turns away. Until your brother's anger turns away from you, and he forgets what you have done to him, then I will sin and bring you from there. Why should I be bereaved also of you both in one day? Here's the sad thing about it. Deception has consequences. It had consequences for Isaac, consequences for Jacob because he had to flee for his life, consequences for Esau who never repented and had this hatred and bitterness in his, in his soul. But there was also consequences for uh, Rebekah. When Jacob pleaded with his mother, I don't want to do this thing. My father will recognize the deceit and call down curses upon me. Rebecca said something so powerful. She said, let his curses come upon me. What was the curse? She sent her son away, intending to bring him back after Esau's wrath has been subsided. She never saw Jacob again. Never. She died not knowing whatever became of her son. Her deception backfired. And deception will always backfire on you. Let it be a sobering reminder to us. So here we have Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Rebecca, and then we'll have Jacob and Rachel as we go forward. Each one of them are in the hall of faith, Hebrews chapter 11. Each of them are are in heaven today, not because they were faithful, but because God is faithful and fulfilling his word. Remember what God reaffirmed to Isaac in Genesis 26. I will make your descendants multiply, and the stars of heaven I will give to your descendants all these lands, and in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. God gave his word to each of them and reaffirmed it over and over again. That's what he does for us. He gives us us his word that if we place our faith in Jesus, we will be forgiven of our sin, cleansed of our sin, and promised everlasting life. And then he gives us the Holy Spirit as a guarantee of that word. And the Holy Spirit reaffirms the word of God over and over that we are a child of God, that we will have everlasting life, and that even though we are faithless, God is faithful. I love what it says in Numbers 23, verse 19. It says, God is not man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said and will he not do? Or has he spoken and will he not make it good? Think about the promises that God has made you, just concerning salvation or anything. Maybe it's something you've prayed and asked God for and it's been like Abraham 25 years or maybe like Isaac uh, 20 years and you haven't seen that purpose. Remember, God is not man that he should lie. And that he will make good on his word. And that includes our salvation. In Hebrews 6 and 13, Paul writes this, For when God made a promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely blessing I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply you. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. We do that in faith. Why? Because even when we are faithless, God is faithful and fulfilling 
his word. Father, we thank you for this word. We thank you again for the journey of faith of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and their descendants, Lord. And it's just another reminder for us that you lead us, you are with us, you will never forsake us, and you have promised that we will arrive home safely. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you guys.